as ever for organizing today's webinar. Uh, it's much appreciated. It's our final one before the summer break, and then we'll be looking to, to get going again in the autumn. So now is your chance. Let us know any topics you'd like us to cover. Just stick it in the chat function or drop myself or Gemma a line with details of what you'd like us to put in the program. Um, it's the, it's a great time to be doing it. We are trying to get a number of webinars run between now and Christmas. So, uh, so just let us know. Um, Geraldine Fleming is a lady who can make any topic fascinating. And I have seen her cover some of the, what would seem to some people, the driest subjects on earth and keep everybody awake and engaged and there's nobody better at doing it. So I'd like to thank her in advance for today. No pressure. Uh, <laughs> and look forward to her presentation on collateral warranties. Geraldine, take it away. Well, talk about bigging me up far too much. Collateral warranties. I am going to try my best, as Guy said, to uh, make it as interesting as possible. So here we go then. Um, collateral warranties. The first few slides in the pack, as normal, is a little bit of information about the company I work for. So uh, as I've already been introduced, I'm Geraldine Fleming. The organization I work for is Driver Tret, and we work across all of the engineering and construction industries. So uh, whether it's marine and offshore, process industrial, utilities or infrastructure, we tend to get involved in all of those types of projects. Uh, we are a global construction company. Uh, we are a market leader in expert witness, planning, commercial, technical, importantly, dispute avoidance. And that's certainly one of the themes that I'll be going through today. If issues that can't be sorted out, of course, we also get involved in dispute resolution as well. Stock market listed with over 300 staff working worldwide. I normally work out of our Hooton office in Cheshire, but as you can see, we've got offices all around the UK. Three parts of the business. Driver Project Services is uh, able to provide quantity surveyors and planners onto your projects. I work in Driver Tret. So again, essentially giving contractual advice, looking at terms up front, drafting terms, and giving advice on dispute avoidance strategy, and of course, dispute resolution. And as well as that, we do have a number of planners and delay analysts that work within the business. The right hand side is Dialis, which is our expert witness division. And we do have experts in quantum delay and technical experts, including civil and structural engineers working for us. Um, Obviously, lots and lots of different ways in which we can help. Um, just highlighting one, uh, of course, advising on collateral warranties is part of what we do on a daily basis. And so if you do get a new form of collateral warranty that you'd like us to have a look at, please do get in touch. Um, there's our Digest magazine, which comes out twice a year, available free from the website, or you can go on our mailing list with the marketing department. A little bit about me. So, yes, I, normally if I'm doing these sessions live, I would get a couple of boos at this point because I am a quantity surveyor and chartered. Um, ex Balfabiti, where I worked for five years as a site quantity surveyor. I went on and did a law degree and my solicitor's exams and have now been in construction claims consultancy for over 20 years. So, the interesting subject of collateral warranties, we are going to look at what on earth is a collateral warranty? Why are they so popular? Is there an obligation to provide a warranty? If you're asked to provide a warranty, do you have to provide one at all? How does the Contract Rights of Third Parties Act fit in? Yeah, I might have a bit of difficulty in making that bit more interesting. But certainly the sections on standard forms of warranty, clauses to watch out for, and a little bit on case law, I think is reasonably interesting. So first of all, then, what is a collateral warranty? And we do start off with, I'm going to say almost a dictionary definition of what a collateral warranty is. It's a contract under which a professional consultant, building contractor, civils contractor, or a subcontractor warrants to a third party that it has complied with its a professional appointment, contract or subcontract. The word collateral means that it sits alongside the contract, which is already in place. Importantly, if there's no collateral warranty in place, a third party who has incurred losses 
may not be able to recover them. So if I was to draw out a family tree here, lots and lots of colours and different lines on the sheet in front of you. Um, if we start off in the middle uh, of this particular diagram with the main contractor, obviously the main contractor can be buying from subcontractors and suppliers themselves. And anywhere where you can see a solid line, that represents a contract between the parties. So I've highlighted there the green line between a main contractor and a normal subcontractor. That is a contract. Between the main contractor and the client or the employer, the blue line, again, that is a contract. Between the client and an engineer, client and the architect, again, there's another contract. And there might well be a sale contract as well between the client and a funder, tenant or purchaser of a particular facility. The dotted lines between the employer and a domestic subcontractor represents a collateral warranty. So there isn't a contract between those two organisations. And what a collateral warranty essentially does is it slots in and forms a contractual link. Similarly, between the funder, tenant and purchaser, there is no link, no contract directly between the funder, tenant or purchaser and the main contractor. So you can see my purple double dotted lines there, again, representing a collateral warranty. If there's already a contract in place, say between the main contractor and the subby, you don't need a collateral warranty between those two organisations. It's where the contract doesn't exist. So we're filling those gaps in. If the main contractor decided that they were going to employ an engineer, so that you would be underneath on my diagram, the client or the employer or the funder, tenant and purchaser may want a direct contractual link with the main contractor's external engineer. So my diagram there, which at first blush looks as if there's lots and lots of lines, actually is a very, very simplified version of trying to show the contracts that exist, as well as the collateral warranties. Of course, you're not going to have just one subcontractor on a job. You're more likely to have 10, 20, 30, 40. And again, all of those lines could then replicate. What does a collateral warranty look like? Well, this is literally one that I was checking last week. And this is only the first two pages. You might just be able to work out on the left hand side, you've got there what's called project data. It's often called warranty data. And it's got the date of the agreement, the relevant parties, the works, um, the title of the contract, and a little bit of information about the beneficiary and also PI insurance. On the right hand side, you can see the starting point of the collateral warranty. And in my experience, a collateral warranty would normally be seven or eight pages long. Um, and a bit like a JCT contract, if you do need a cure for insomnia for yourself or anyone in your family, collateral warranties are an excellent way to make yourself fall asleep very, very quickly because they are boring documents and they are generally written in old fashioned legal language as well. Why are collateral warranties so popular? Well, to be quite frank, it's all about the fact that in construction, unfortunately, insolvency is um, a fact of life. And also because we don't make widgets in the construction industry. And um, there's a few nice, interesting pictures of well, it could be bad workmanship or it could be uh, owner misuse. And um, so we've got a flooding issue on the top left hand corner. And um, I don't know how many people are Queen fans. There you go. There's a, an interesting reference to get into a collateral warranty seminar. But I just heard on the 12 o'clock news that Brian May is devastated because the ground floor of his no doubt very, very big house is flooded and he has lost a huge amount of Queen memorabilia. Um, who can he sue? 
I have no idea, but I'm sure he will be consulting lawyers over that problem. That is not a picture of his property, by the way. Um, top right hand corner, probably something that affects most garden walls at some point in time where there's been some kind of settlement on one side of the wall. Um, certainly a popular subject at the moment, sinkholes that appear from time to time and you get members of the general public looking in horror at what's happening outside their houses. Um, and obviously on a much more sober note, we've got there a picture of Grenfell uh, mid-fire. Um, I think that now is just over four years ago. Um, the inquiry is still carrying on there. Um, nobody has actually been charged, as far as I'm aware, in relation to what happened at Grenfell. But no doubt people are checking contracts and collateral warranties in terms of their own liability. Sticking with this popularity issue, why do we use collateral warranties? Well, there certainly is this issue of familiarity. We've always done it, so we will carry on doing it in the future. So generally, certainly for a developer, having a collateral warranty is part of their normal set of protections. And the issue, of course, is where problems arise on a project. From the developer's perspective, if the main contractor is insolvent, the developer wants to be able to go and sue subcontractors and third party designers. This would be a loss in tort, otherwise known as pure economic loss. And without a collateral warranty in place, the chances are the developer couldn't leapfrog over the dead main contractor and sue that subcontractor directly. I did already mention this issue of insolvency and the high likelihood of insolvency happening in our industry versus other industries. Also, unfortunately, a high level of defects. Um, again, this is because of the one-off nature of the product that we produce, the property, the bridge, the road, or whatever it happens to be. And essentially, the owner of a property that could be a local authority, could be a private developer. They want to protect their interests. And there is certainly a perception that a product such as a building or a facility has an increased value where there is a collateral warranty attached to it. Also, the Contracts Rights of Third Parties Act that I've mentioned once already is still relatively new and there haven't been enough cases on how that works. So do you have to provide one? Is there an obligation to provide a collateral warranty? Well, in typical fashion for I think every web webinar or seminar I've ever given, the phrase, it depends, comes to mind. And it will absolutely depend on what the contract says. So, of course, if you don't have a contract in place and you have a collateral warranty, then you will have to analyse the relationship between the parties. The easy situation is where the contract is entirely silent, which essentially means that there is then no obligation to provide a collateral warranty. So I have a challenge for everybody who is on this session. Um, if you do have a situation where your contract is silent about providing a warranty and somebody asks you to provide that warranty, then you shouldn't be providing anything like that for free. Because essentially you are allowing somebody who isn't a party to the contract to have the right to see you in the future. And that is something you should consider charging for. My current record is £3,000, which was a subcontractor who phoned me up and said, I've done what you've told me to do, Geraldine. I've checked the contract. I cannot see any obligation on me to have to provide a collateral warranty. Um, he said, what do I do next? And I said, well, your choice is you don't have to provide one or 
you can charge. And we decided that £3,000 was an appropriate amount to ask for. And obviously, in this particular situation, the main contractor was very, very desperate to get this warranty and did indeed issue an instruction with an agreed sum of £3,000 for the provision of that collateral warranty. A second situation, and I think this is probably the stickiest type of situation in regard to collateral warranties, is where the contract or subcontract does say you have to provide a warranty, but there's no draft version in the, in the contract itself. You then can choose the format of the warranty and the words and the text in that warranty because they haven't actually contracted with you to sign up to a particular version. Um, my starting point on this would generally be the JCT warranties because they are the most contractor or subcontractor friendly version. The third one, which is probably the easiest of the three, is where there is a contract in place and one of the appendices contains the draft collateral warranty that you have to sign up to. And there's also a clause in there as well. And it'll say something like my version 2.8 at the bottom. The subcontractor shall within seven days from receipt of a notice from the contractor that identifies the beneficiary and requires execution of such a collateral warranty, execute and deliver the collateral warranties requested by the contractor, failing which the subcontractor shall provide the collateral warranties at Schedule 3 or as the contractor may otherwise, otherwise direct. If you don't then provide the requested warranty, quite simply, you are in breach of contract. So for me, for every contract you enter into, whether you're a contractor or a subcontractor, you should know what the situation is with regard to the collateral warranty. And if the contract does contain the draft warranty, you absolutely must check it before you sign up to that particular contract. Okay, the bit that I'm going to struggle to make interesting is the Contract Rights of Third Parties Act. Um, yes, it is a very boring piece of legislation and it has definitely caused an interruption to collateral warranties, but it hasn't really had the effect that I'll say some people thought it would have. If I go back in time, the old rule before this piece of legislation came out was quite simply this. A contract can only be enforced by the parties to it. So a subcontractor can enforce a contract against a main contractor and vice versa or a main contractor can enforce a contract against an employer and vice versa. But what you can't do is leapfrog. You can't go from the developer, local authority, the client, leapfrog over the main contractor and then actually sue the subcontractor directly. And so before this piece of legislation came in, the old rule being privity of contract, only the parties to the contract can sue under it, meant that we needed another device so that the employers could sue subcontractors, suppliers, designers directly. And that device is, of course, the collateral warranty. Since May 2000, though, we've also had this Contract Rights of Third Parties Act 1999 in play. And yes, as I said before, it is a boring piece of legislation, but I am going to read out just a little bit of it. It says, subject to the provisions of this act, a party who is not a party to a contract, a third party, may in his own right enforce a term of the contract if the contract expressly provides that he may or Subject to subsection two, the term purports to confer a benefit on him. So in other words, if you've got a clause in the contract that says, and the local authority 
can expressly use any term of this contract to enforce this contract, then essentially we now come under the umbrella of the Contract Rights of Third Parties Act. However, there is this get out at subsection two, which says subsection 1b does not apply if on a proper construction of the contract, it appears that the parties did not intend the term to be enforceable by the third party. And what you tend to find in construction is early on in the contract, there's an opt out clause. So essentially the parties opt out of the Contract Rights of Third Parties Act. And again, when I'm doing these sessions live, I normally get a hand going up at this point and someone asking me, hang on, you can't contract of, out of legislation, can you? Surely legislation just applies. Well, actually, in this case, the legislation itself lets the parties decide whether to essentially opt into the Act, which might be done by default, or expressly opt out. So again, you need to know the position with this Contract Rights of Third Parties Act. Um, well, we are now in 2021, so I would imagine that any of the contracts that you ever approach me about now were entered into after the 11th of May 2000. So in other words, this act will apply. So yes, you can include a term to opt into this act. And in that case, then the local authority, developer, funder, tenant, purchaser can then enforce it. The way that JCT is written is it essentially says that the Contract Rights of Third Parties Act does not apply unless Clause 7.4 is completed. So the wording here is other than such rights of any purchasers, tenants and or funder as take effect pursuant to Clauses 7a and 7b, nothing in this contract confers or is intended to confer any right to enforce any of its terms on any person who is not a party to it. Again, that's a fancy legal way of saying the Contract Rights of Third Parties Act does not apply to this contract. And then you can see here referenced details of third party rights and collateral warranties. <laughs> NEC, um, slightly different, and um, we've got different wordings. So NEC3, you actually then have got an option clause, okay, which applies, otherwise you've opted out. So why 3.1, why UK 3.1 says, a person who or organization who is not one of the parties may enforce a term of this contract under the Contract Rights of Third Parties Act only if the term and the person or organisation are stated in the contract data. So working backwards, if you've chosen YUK3 and the people are stated in the contract data, that limited list of people or organisations can do that leapfrogging, as I mentioned before. If you've chosen Y UK3 but not filled it in with the person or organization, then it can't be used. The Contract Rights of Third Parties Act doesn't apply. The difficult thing here is where you haven't chosen Y UK3, and then it's a matter of interpretation whether that leapfrogging can happen or not. Similarly, we've got very similar wording. It's just a slightly in a different order. You can see there NEC4 referenced. Again, a beneficiary can enforce the terms under the Contract Rights of Third Parties Act, um, but only the parties and a beneficiary. So in other words, those that are actually listed. So again, there's just a little bit of, I'm going to say, not the, the drafting isn't as clear as I would like in relation to NEC contracts. 
So standard forms of collateral warranty is the next section to run through. And again, normally I'd be doing boos and cheers during this section, very much thinking of you guys being either a contractor or a subcontractor. And normally the clue is in the initials, okay? So if I was say to say to you that the initials are BPF, you might not realize that the BPF stands for the British Property Federation. Straight away, because I'm wearing my contractor and subcontractor hat today, BPF, that's going to be a boo from me. Essentially, because this is going to be collateral warranties for um, the property industry. So in other words, that would benefit employers. Now, the last time these uh, agreements were actually issued is back in 2005. We have been promised new versions awaited because these are no longer in print, but regularly we would see either these or a hybrid version being used. So if you see BPF used, assuming you are a contractor or a subcontractor, this is not what you want to use at all. Alternatively, I am going to give a hooray to JCT because actually taking all of the other possibilities on the market, JCT probably has the most contractor and subcontractor friendly versions that are on the market. They aren't perfect. I would still, if I was again wearing my contractor subcontractor hat, I'd want some further tweaks, but actually they are a very, very good starting point. If you are looking at um, professional appointment warranties, then the CIC documents are worth looking at. So they are to do with consultants and subconsultants, not suitable, importantly, for contractors and subcontractors. Uh, fairly recent as well, published in November 2018. We also have, again, for consultants, the ACE, uh, Association of Consulting Engineers, and again, very recently published, November 2020. And if I was working for um, engineers, architects, etc., cetera, um, I would be hard pushed to choose really between the CIC and the ACE. And at this point, I'm going to give another boo because the NEC does not publish collateral warranties. Interestingly, there is no reference even to warranties in NEC 3, but we do have reference in NEC 4, but they don't refer to collateral warranties. And instead, they use the phrase undertakings, uh, which has nothing to do with um, your gas and electricity supply or funeral directors in any way, but effectively is an international way of saying collateral warranties because the phrase collateral warranties is very particular to the UK. Again, under NEC, this is an option clause. So if X8 isn't chosen, then either there's going to be some other Z clauses about collateral warranties or quite simply, collateral warranties aren't required. The top box on the notes there is in relation to the black book or the main contract. And the bottom double framed box is in relation to subcontractors. And um, just to read a couple of these clauses out, um, X8.1, the contractor gives undertakings to others as stated in the contract data. So of course, this isn't to the client because there's already a contract there. This would be to funders, tenants, and purchasers. X8.2, if the contractor subcontracts the work stated in the contract data, it arranges for the subcontractor to provide a subcontractor undertaking to others if required by the client. So that is effectively a double leapfrog. Um, if the contractor subcontracts the work stated in the contract data, it, it arranges for the subby to provide that subcontractor undertaking to the client. X8.4, um, how do you know the format? Well, the form 
of the warranty or the undertaking should be set out in the scope. And then it's the client who prepares the documents, sends them to the contractor. The contractor then signs them or arranges for the subby to sign them. And then it all goes back to the client within three weeks. It's similar clauses there for the subby. You can see there at X 8.3, the subcontractor has only got two weeks to sign them off because of course the contractor needs a little bit of time themselves. So nothing too uh, exciting or unusual in terms of NEC, apart from the fact that there is no NEC warranty um, and also that it's an optional clause. So again, watch out for that. So clauses to watch out for is the next section. Um, certainly when somebody ever puts a slide up like this, oh God, you do just want to groan because there is so much text on the slide. But bear with me, okay, because I have done some highlighting here. Um, essentially the first few clauses in a collateral warranty normally set out the purpose of the particular warranty in place. And this one is no exception. You'll be pleased to know I am not going to read the whole lot out. The words that I particularly uh, want to highlight here, um, you can see the first bit that's highlighted where the contractor has to exercise all reasonable skill and care. And higher up on the second line, it talks about all due diligence. I am not a fan in collateral warranties of the word all and I would want that to be crossed out because all reasonable scare, reasonable skill and care is higher than just reasonable skill and care which is essentially where your uh, PI insurance would probably sit. No surprise in clause two there that you will have responsibility for the design of the works. That is normally what happens. However, when I do see phrases like the selection of materials, and in this particular example, being designed or selected in accordance with best practice, and again, we have a very long definition there of best practice, this is moving too much for me towards a fitness for purpose level of liability, which is likely to be higher than your own PI insurance will cover you for. Interestingly, on this particular one, they then don't use the word all when they're talking about exercising skill, care and diligence, but it does use the phrase first class contractor. I have to admit that this particular warranty, which is the one I checked last week, I had never seen that phrase before, never been tested in the courts. Um, I'd probably define it as a really, really, really good contractor, which means that you have to be better than a competent contractor, which again is taking it too far for me. So I don't like that particular wording. And the other thing I don't particularly like here is on the third line of the definition of best practice. I don't like this phrase maintenance obligations either. Um, I don't know what's in this particular contract in relation to the obligations of the contractor, but I wouldn't want them to have a maintenance obligation, perhaps unless they were a landscape contractor. Um, design liability. Um, again, 1.2. This is from a different warranty now. And um, this one definitely had the flashing lights around it for me. Uh, without derogation from clause 1.1. And to the extent that under the building contract, the contractor takes responsibility for the design of the development or the management and integration of any third party design the building contractor shall ensure that the design of the development is fit for its purpose. I have to admit, I would need to cross the whole of that clause out and say the contractor's design responsibility is as set out in the building contract or in the NEC and just quite simply go back to back. So reasonable skill and care gets a thumbs up from me, fitness for purpose or fit for intended purpose, 
I am not keen on. Again, PI insurers, uh, we are already on the back foot in terms of PI insurance going up and what it covers going down. So I would imagine that the vast majority of PI insurers will not cover you for a fit for purpose level of liability. And I'll also just point out this issue of third party design. Why should you take on board the third party design integration responsibility? Again, that's something that I am sure lawyers will would build up significant fees on trying to work out what that actually means. Another clause, again, lots and lots of text on here, but we won't read it all out. Um, insurance, and in particular, this issue of PI insurance. Um, of course, it's very, very common to see 12 years being the period for which you need to keep the PI insurance on. That's 12 years from completion of the works. And particularly for subcontractors, you might be an early trade on a project. You would want that 12 year period to run from your completion and not completion of the main contract or completion of the project project. It does say here a couple of times, providing such insurance is available on commercially reasonable terms. Uh, so a great phrase that no doubt is going to come to some scrutiny going forward. Um, I would prefer something far more tangible, such as within 10% of the original policy cost. I uh, have not ever persuaded anyone to put that in a collateral warranty, unfortunately. Um, however, I would prefer to see that clause in than not have it at all, because at least then you've got a fighting chance of being able to say, actually, this this insurance cover is no longer available. Um, also very common, the last sentence there that the contractor has to provide documentary evidence. Um, certainly a failing that I think employers have is they don't regularly check up on that insurance. If you're sat there as a subcontractor, um, or potentially where there's a funder involved and you're the main contractor, you quite often see either discontinuance clauses or step-in rights, which is far easier to say. Um, I will read this one out. Uh, this clause says, the contractor shall not terminate its employment, treat its employment as having been terminated, or suspend the carrying out of the works under the contract, brackets discontinue, without giving the beneficiary not less than 28 days notice of the contractor's intention to discontinue, specifying the grounds for the discontinuance. Um, yes, if I was sat there as the bank funding a particular project, I would want to be given 28 days breathing space before a contractor or a subcontractor suspended or terminated. So I absolutely understand why it goes in there. However, for the contractor and possibly more for the subcontractor, I want the right to suspend work after giving seven days notice if I'm not paid. 28 days is far too long. So again, I would want some alternative drafting here. So potentially the termination being 28 days, I could live with, but a separate clause on suspension saying that it's seven days, but that I also have to provide the notice to the beneficiary at the same time as the contractor. There are normally a lot more clauses there about step-in rights. Again, if I'm the contractor or subcontractor, if the developer, client, or whoever has become insolvent, then I probably do want somebody to step in and make good and carry on the work as long as I am paid any outstanding monies. Moving on to uh, limitation clauses next. Um, in my view, um, engineers, architects, m and &E consultants are normally very good at limiting their liability, far better than contractors and subcontractors. And what I would like to see, again, wearing my contractor and subby hat today, is more of you embracing what are called net contribution clauses. 
So in other words, if a particular issue has happened, so I shall take Brian May's flooding of the downstairs of his property over the last couple of days, well, it might be that me as the subcontractor, I'm 10% to blame. Well, if everybody else around me is actually insolvent, what I don't want to do is be 100% liable. So what a net contribution clause does is it says you're only liable as far as you have made a mistake. So me as the subcontractor, I'd only have to pay 10% out in that particular example. Without a net contribution clause, I could be on the hook for 100% on the joint and several liability principle. 1.3 gets a big thumbs up from me. Sometimes cause called a no greater duty clause or an equivalent rights of defense clause. Again, I will read this one out. The subcontractor shall be entitled in any action or proceedings by the beneficiary to rely on any term in the subcontract and to raise the equivalent rights in defense of liability as it would have against the main contractor under the subcontract. That gets a thumbs up because let's say if I've only got a simple contract and I'm on a six year level of liability, then I can say, sorry, mate, you're out of time. If someone comes after me in year eight, I don't like the words in brackets, though, because if I'm still owed money by the main contractor, I want to set off against the monies that the main contractor should have owed me to now my liability against the beneficiary. So that's a more detailed tweak in relation to those clauses. Moving on and looking at assignment clauses, or it's probably easier to call them pass the parcel clauses. If you imagine that you're the subcontractor and you say to the contractor, well, there's a contract between us, so you can sue me. You can pass that right to your client. So that means that in an example, let's say um, the developer can now sue the contractor because there's a contract and can now sue you as the subcontractor. But that developer might want to pass the collateral warranty onto B&Q as an example, or probably more likely to be Primark the way they are growing at the moment. So they want to pass that parcel of being able to sue across to somebody else. What I don't like to see is an unlimited game of pass the parcel. And what I would prefer to see is a limit on the number of assignments. And again, I will um, blow the JCT trumpet at this point and say that's nice because it only allows two games of pass the parcel. So in other words, it can only be passed on twice. And I think that's sensible. Other clauses to watch out for, you can all breathe a sigh of relief. I am not doing any more <coughs> reading of contract clauses in this part. Um, deleterious materials, make sure it's clear in terms of um, your rights and obligations. Uh, importantly, copyright and use of your design. Generally, I'm relaxed when I see clauses that say that the beneficiary can use your design but limited to this project only. But I don't want it to be an unlimited license. Uh, insurance, we touched on the amount, the period, but importantly, the type. Is it on an each and every basis or is it on an aggregate basis? We did touch on selection of materials, which could amount to design. We touched on the validity period and for subcontractors in particular, it being tied up to main contract practical completion. And every, every now and again, it's, probably, it's quite rare to see these ones, the adjudication decision potentially being referred to as being final and binding. Um, it depends whether you win or lose, whether you like this particular clause, but insurers generally don't like to see that. If I was the developer, then I would want a copy of the subcontract being attached. I'll be honest, I'm not really bothered about the pricing, so I could see that being redacted quite um, sensibly. Uh, law and jurisdiction and notices are also worth looking out for. 
So the final main section for this afternoon's session is case law. So this is where I attempt to frighten you into reading collateral warranties going forward. The first case uh, actually is a famous case involving Scottish widows and three separate parties, Harmon Facades, BDP and WSA back in 2010. And this was all about a development in, funnily enough, Edinburgh, given that it was to do with Scottish widows, and the roof and the curtain walling. Now, the rectification costs of the facade was going to cost over £5 million. And importantly, this was the first case where the courts agreed that a net contribution clause in a collateral warranty was valid. However, the parties had to go out and get expert evidence to decide how the apportionment was going to be sorted out between the parties. So it was agreed that, yes, there was a, a fault or a defect and that it had to be rectified. But what percentage were each of the parties liable for? So net contribution clauses, again, thumbs up from me. Uh, 2013 case Parkwood Leisure and Lango Rourke. Now there had been a bit of debate before 2013 as to whether a collateral warranty is a construction contract. And the answer came very firmly back from the courts. It depends. And the question that the court asked itself was whether the wording in the collateral warranty constituted a contract for the carrying out of construction operations. And this was important because of one of the parties wanted to go to adjudication to resolve a dispute. In this particular example, the collateral warranty used, used the phrase warrants, acknowledges and undertakes. And the court said, yes, this was a contract for the carrying out of construction operations and therefore the parties could use adjudication. And again, that was a groundbreaking decision at the time. Liberty, Mercian and Cuddy in 2014. Uh, the contractor certainly uh, got into a bit of difficulty here. There was a contractual requirement for the contractor to provide the employer with a bond and a collateral warranty. And there was a basically a fight between the parties resulting in the employer terminating due to a repudiatory breach, normally where the contractor has walked off. The court found here that the contractor's obligation to provide a performance bond and a collateral warranty did survive termination or repudiation of the contract. So the fact that the employer had said, right, we're not working together anymore, which actually the contractor had already said that earlier, the need to provide the bond and the collateral warranty remained in place. It went to court three times. The first decision essentially meant the parties had to go away and get more information. In the second case, Cuddy um, then had to use best endeavours to go and get the bond and warranties, and they needed more information about impossibility. Cuddy was able to provide evidence that they couldn't provide a bond, and so they had to pay a sum equivalent to the performance bond into court. In relation to the collateral warranties, the court forced Cuddy to provide those warranties. It was an order for specific performance, which is rare in construction. The court said that damages would not be an adequate remedy. Let's move on quickly to 2018. Um, Swansea Stadium and Interserve. Um, 2004, there was a design and build contract for Liberty Stadium between Swansea City Council and Interserve. The practical completion date was the 31st of March 2005. Remember that date. Swansea Stadium Management were given a 50 year lease of the stadium on the 24th of April 2005 and received a collateral warranty from Interserve, which was a deed. Now, those of you who are good at adding up will already be getting their calculators out and going 2005 plus 12 years gives us 2017. 
you are correct. Swansea Stadium Management issued proceedings on the 4th of April 2017 for the sum of 1.3 million due to defective design and construction and alleging failure to repair. The court said, unfortunately, Swansea Stadium Management, you are out of time. This action is time barred. The action accrued on the 31st of March 2005 at the 12 years on gives us 31st of March 2017. They were four days late in a 12 year period and therefore InterServe effectively were very, very pleased with this particular result. Current issues to be aware of. Professional indemnity insurance Goodness, the, the number of conversations I've had with different subcontractors and main contractors recently about how PI insurance has increased enormously. And of course, that is significantly linked with Grenfell related issues. We touched on the words earlier on, provided that such insurance is available at commercially reasonable rates, which does appear in this clause and the one that we looked at, at earlier. If those words were missing, then actually you have a strict liability to provide that PI insurance, regardless of the fact it's going to cost you an awful lot more money. So you do want to see that wording in there. The piggy in the middle scenario, where the main contractor has agreed to provide subcontract warranties and the subcontractor refuses or wants to change the wording. That is a very, very difficult situation. Of course, hindsight is a wonderful thing. What I would expect, certainly from the people on the call, is that essentially you make sure you always include the draft warranties within the subcontract. And everybody raises any difficulties with the wording at the earliest possible opportunity. Um, sometimes employers can be a little bit nice and tweak their wordings. In other instances, that's where the main contractor needs to get their wallet out and grease the wheels in order for the subcontractor to sign up to what is going to be wording that actually attracts more liability across. So in summary, pretty obvious stuff. Um, make sure that you're very clear as to whether warranties are required and agree the wording as part of contract negotiations. Make sure that your liability in the warranty is no higher than set out in the contract. Watch insurance clauses in particular. Keep a record of the warranties that you've given and be very, very clear on the end date. If I am working with subcontractors, I want it tied into your work and not the work of others. So that was the easy bit of the seminar. And it is, as normal, with much trepidation, I ask Gemma, are there any questions? Oh, there are, there are. Oh my God. Okay, thank you, Daniel. I'm putting my cheeriest voice on here. Is it possible to have a collateral warranty with four or five parties to it? Funder, client, main contract? Yes, it absolutely is. So that the funder and client then has a contractual relationship with the designer. And well, I, my view, Daniel, is it is possible, but it would be too easy to find yourself in a bowl of spaghetti in this particular scenario. So my advice would be that actually the draft warranty that goes into the contract or subcontract, essentially, normally in square brackets, has the different parties but then when you come to actually execute the warranties, I would want each one standing on its own footing, so to speak, so that the funder client does have the direct contractual relationship with the designer, but actually the other parties are still mentioned as well. So yeah, I would prefer, um, if you're sat there as the designer at the bottom, I'd want it clear and unambiguous. And actually, if I was one of the other parties, I'd want it the same. So yeah, my, my view, Daniel, uh, multiple warranties would be the way to go for ease, if that's okay. Right, Gemma, I've got, oh, there's another one. I tried. Okay. Does a subby have to hold PI insurance cover for 12 years from completion of the main contract works 
or completion of the subcontractor's works. I think that Daniel has actually got a collateral warranty on his desk as we speak. Daniel, um, it's going to depend on the warranty. So if you're the subcontractor, I would want the warranty to specifically state that it the 12 years runs from completion of your works. However, if you sign the warranty up as be as running from completion of the main contractor's works, then unfortunately you could have to hold that PI insurance for 12, 13, 14 years. And actually, you get into a really sticky area uh, where the main contractor has become insolvent partway through and maybe the works um, were then delayed for a year or more. So definitely always tie it into your own works. But it's whatever the warranty says that will stand. Go on, give it me again, Gemma. Is there another one? Here we go. Um, any success of contractors getting additional monies to pay for increased PI insurance costs. Um, not when the contract is actually already in place, but certainly at the negotiation point. So before the two parties have signed up and you're still in that negotiation position, yes, at that point. Um, if I take it forward several months on and maybe the job is finished and it talks about this commercially reasonable rate, so far, I have not been involved in any, but I actually think we are at a tipping point now. And the, the issue really for contractors and subcontractors in relation to this question is, do they hold their hand up and approach the insurance company or the beneficiary and say, um, actually, the PI that we promised to give you six years ago is gone. We don't hold each and every insurance anymore, nor do we hold it at 10, 10 million. All we can get is 5 million on an aggregate basis unless you pay us more money. Most contractors and subcontractors are reluctant to bring the issue up. But at some point, we're going to have a top down approach that developers, local authorities will do audits on subcontractors uh, and on main contractors and they will then start to look for evidence of PI and that's where the conversation will start. So the short answer is not yet but I am expecting it Dave. Gee everyone saved up all the questions for the collateral warranty one okay um, right thank you Ian. Um, is the only way of guaranteeing this any rights of third parties under NEC are excluded is to select UK3 and to state not in contract data. And no, it's not the only way. That is one way. And um, the other way that you could do it is steal the JCT wording. OK, and you can just steal the JCT wording and put it in as a Z clause. And that's a cleaner way of doing it, Ian, I think. Next, Gemma. Oh, hooray. Excellent. <laughs> I think that's the most questions we have ever had. So thank you for uh, being at the controls, Gemma, much appreciated. I was trying to think of something really complicated to ask then. And then I thought, no, I'll let, I'll let you off. You've had quite a few today. <laughs> <laughs> and we're just over two o'clock, so we've not done too bad Perfect on time. Timing. So. Perfect timing. 